Welcome to the Jay and Pav Podcast Experience. Listening to the Che and Pav Show, Teachers Talking Teaching, where two middle school teachers share in our reflections, insights about the topics that matter the most in the classroom. So, hey, Pav, join us in the hallway or even the parking lot, or better yet, how about the staff room? To episode 126 of the Chain Pav Show. Thank you for joining us as we sit around the table to talk teaching. Today, Che and I recap our past year as centrally assigned teachers and some of the great work we had the opportunity to engage in before everything changed. So let's dive right into this conversation and chit chat about our experiences. My name is Pav Wander. It is a pleasure to be here today with my co-host, who I never introduce. He does that himself. This episode is going to be a cup of coffee in the big time. Cup of coffee in the big time. And Pav, we know the cream rises to the top. <laughs> that was really good. And my name is Che Taking up too much space, Cheney. Oh, I thought you were going to go with Che Macho Man. Because the cream rises to the top, (laughs) rises to the top. But I had to go with that reference, Pav, because, you know, that's a little tongue-in-cheek because, you know, we always get such great reviews (laughs) until until we don't. You really hung up on that one bad review. Uh, Yes. We've got, like... Close to a hundred positive reviews, like five star reviews, and then there's one. I was so disappointed that you took up too much space. You know it's the Chain Pav show, right? Like I don't know who else you're expecting to hear from. I know our guests, our guests that we interview are great guests to yeah. listen to. But our interaction is we're supposed to all be peers and colleagues in that space. So yeah. I find, and you know what, Pav, I know I you have to tell the story of why you wouldn't tell me this review existed. Because because of this, <laughs> why else wouldn't I tell you? Um, no, you're but you're absolutely right. It is silly, right? I can I can brush it aside because it is what one bad review, and I take that as a compliment. It's not until there's enough people listening that you get the bad reviews that you know you know you've sort of hit like a little bit of a different echelon. Oh. It's not just your friends and neighbors who are writing your reviews for you. Now there's people out there that have come across our show. And, and yes, it was, um, it was an interview episode. And, and for those of you who are longtime listeners of the Che and Pav show, it did not start off that way. This, this is a, a reflective space for Che and myself. And when we started doing interviews, it was not solely to, you know, to, to have, to hear from that person only. It was to engage in conversation with that person. And it was to talk pedagogy because we never invited somebody onto the show before we had done some research into the work that they were doing and, and found their work valuable for our classroom pedagogy and for our own growth as educators. So why wouldn't we have something to say during those conversations? Um, so we reflect it and we reflect on, on the things that our guests say. So I, I completely understand. I know that you were upset, but, but I under, I take it a little bit differently. It's not till you start getting the bad reviews that you, you know, you've made it when you start getting those. The cream's going to rise to the top. The cream always rises to the uh, When the coffee is fresh. No. <laughs> or else it just curdles. <laughs> and then it just curdles. But the Michael Jordan and me, you know, Pav, always fixates on these stories because it drives my energy. I know it does. Um, this episode is, you know, you talked about this, Pav, it's sort of 
I don't want to say it's a review, but it's a manifestation of our coach's roles. And I'll start with a little anecdote. We were in these roles, and then newly, you knew started this year. I started a few months into this year, mm -hmm. and it's been some growing, and it's been some learning, and it's been a big shift on where we are positioned within our board. Because all of a sudden, you're not solely attached to one school, mm -hmm. one set of administrators, one classroom, and get connected with those 30 students. It's a much broader experience, and it's a little bit tougher to register your impact because you don't get that necessarily immediate feedback from how your students engage um, with your lesson. And it's been a lot of new learning, and I think it was very abrupt for us how it came to an end and although yeah. the school year is not over our roles are over yeah and when you certainly talk about the i'll read into a little anecdote what was the decision to come up with this episode because we had never brainstormed that we were going to do an episode to talk about our roles as coaches but similar to the apprentice and donald trump and around the panel table because we got called in for a meeting uh, we were fired <laughs> yes. yes i mean we that's were. a little over the top but in essence um if you know the story of our board and our and our city, you may already know this, but if you don't, our positions were sort of restructured for next year. So 100 middle year success counselors, along with K-12 to coaches and along with early reading coaches, well, those two roles, the K-12 to and the early reading coach, were completely cut for next year. Mm -hmm. And then our, I guess there's 100 middle year success counselors across the board. They were going to change it down to 25. So a massive... Uh, cut from 69 to S sorry 69. To 25 yeah which would also mean a restructuring of the job so the job right. in essence won't exist uh, as is right and then two days after that notice for next year we were brought into an office and told and we are going to start this almost immediately so we are not even going to finish the year literally you're fired yeah and then you and I sort of you tried to absorb all this we said now's the time that we need to document our experience while it's fresh as a coach because in three months it's going to be distance and we're just going to be recalling singular, singular moments. And so our yeah. anecdote to getting started on this episode was the whole idea of once we got fired, it became time to stop, reflect, document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I suppose... Um you know, we weren't fired. We're still, we're still teachers. We're still part of the, well, we're still part of the district. We're still part of the board. Um, and we are still in classrooms, but our roles are very different from what they were when we were coaches, when we were centrally assigned teachers. So no longer are we, um, doing the work. And, and I have to say that I had all intention of trying to continue to do some of the work um, because I have been redeployed um, to one of the two schools that mm. I was supporting directly. And so I am still currently in the school where I was working as a middle year student success counselor. So I had, I had very high hopes to be able to continue to do some of that work in the space that I currently am. Um, unfortunately, so far, that has not been the case. I have not been able to because Che and I are both we have been redeployed as now occasional teachers. So we are now filling those unfilled jobs um, that may exist in schools, in the schools that we are in um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we've got four unfilled jobs, three supply teachers have showed up to fill those. There's one job that's still unfilled. Rather than collapsing programs um, in the school and uh, collapsing classes in order to free up a teacher to cover that space, um, Che and I are, and, and as well as the other centrally assigned teachers are in those schools um, to be able to fill those unfilled jobs. And so there is absolutely a need for it. I don't want to say that there isn't because this is something that definitely is occurring in all schools across the system uh, and probably across, across the country and across North America. I don't doubt that. Um, but in order to fulfill these unfilled jobs, we are being taken away from the very, very important work that we had been doing since the beginning of this year and for many of the centrally assigned teachers for several years now uh, and, in order to fulfill this. And so um, so I'm, I'm not going to – no, I am going to say I'm a little bitter about it. <laughs> well, Pab, the bitterness comes because ultimately we become – the system becomes a massive ball of hypocrisy. Yes. Wave of hypocrisies. Uh, because these spaces, when we dive into our content, those roles of coaches, how quickly was it to dispense? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about all this system work and disrupting systems and challenging systems, 
as much as we preach this, we stopped at the first pushback on our system that it wasn't working, and we put the burden on this probably 150 redeploy teachers to keep the system working because the system isn't going to change. And we position ourselves centrally to tell everyone else to disrupt the norm, to challenge the system, to check out these system inequalities. And then when there's just a little bad of reality coming back to the center, mm -hmm. oh, hold on. We need to protect the system without any fundamental change. Let's put the extra burden on individuals to make it work. And you know, one of my, you know, spitefulness is about how quiet Central has been um, in trying to eat this ball of hypocrisy. I Yes. And and when you say how quiet Central is, has been, I want to make it clear that it's not the teachers, not the, not the individuals that are in this role, because there has been lots of uh, speak out about this. There's been a lot of work with the union. There's been a lot of work with teachers collaboratively coming together to talk about this and, and try to push back, um, uh, you know, trustee meetings and all kinds of spaces where we've had the opportunity to speak out and, and we have been able to do that. We have done it. Um, I think that ultimately this comes down to a funding issue that, that we will, you know, continue to face, unfortunately, within public education, uh, especially with the current government that we are sitting with. Definitely a funding issue. Definitely a funding issue. And and I feel like, you know, our our jobs were easily the very first ones to be cut because we are in those positions. Um we are working directly with students all the time, but it's like when push comes to shove, who is going to be the fastest that we can cut and redeploy and throw into other roles in order to keep the system afloat? Unfortunately, that's that's the collateral damage that we have experienced over the past couple of weeks. And, uh, and, and it's really unfortunate because everything came to an abrupt halt. Uh, all of the work that we had been doing and there were many, many projects that we were working on and, and so many things that are still in the back of my mind. As I was just saying to Che before we hit record, I need to touch base with, with the principal at the other school that I was with because we had some things on the go and I haven't checked in. I haven't been able to check in to see how those things are going. And as much as I want to support, I can't say that I, I'm going to have the time to because every day is being taken up from morning till, till the end of the day with covering classes and providing prep payback. And so I don't know that I have the capacity to be able to assist mm -hmm. in that role, but I know the need exists because these were important things that we were doing and they were very individual to the school. They were very specific to the needs of those particular schools where we had built up these really, really meaningful relationships that took us a year to be able to build up to. And now they've just come to an abrupt halt. And so it, it's, it eats at us as coaches, as centrally assigned teachers, because we become invested in these things that we were doing because we were able to monitor and see the impact and, and we wanted to see it through. And now it's just, it's finished, it's done. And, and there's no finality to it. I know, never explain anything through sports, but as Mike Tyson say, everyone's got a plan to get punched square in the face. Yeah. And we've been punched square in the face and this sets us up beautifully for our content. So thank you for tuning into the Chain Pav Show and we'll be right back after this quick commercial. And you're listening to The Che and Pav Show Episode 126 And we're talking about the roles of coaches And as we've ranted for the first 15 minutes Pav, I think we want to position this conversation About what are the roles of these centrally assigned teachers Whether you're early reading coach K-12 learning coach A middle-year success counselor But if you're centrally assigned and deployed What is the real role And what are these values of these positions I think we have simplified versions. I know, Pav, mm -hmm. when I was a classroom teacher, I didn't appreciate this role as much as I should have. Now, having been in the role, I'll know how to tap into this resource yeah. a little bit more effectively um, when I return to the classroom for next year. And I look forward to it. But I think this provided us an opportunity to really share, now that we've had some experiences, what are those roles of coaches? What can they do? And how do we foster those relationships to sort of bridge... The, the hesitation within schools to embrace what the coach uh, can bring to the learning space. 
A hundred percent. I agree with you that um, as a classroom teacher, I did not fully appreciate the scope of a centrally assigned teacher and what they can offer uh, individual teachers and what they can offer to the school community. Uh, and now that I've been in the position, I encourage if these if these jobs ever return, if you are uh, a teacher and you've never you know sort of dabbled with um, perhaps going central to at least one time in your career, try and give that a try. Uh, because I think that it is such a valuable learning experience and, and to be able to tap into multiple schools in a single school year and to see what culture looks like in different spaces, what different grade levels look like in different parts of the city. What a valuable experience just on a personal level to be able to have the opportunity to do that. Um, but certainly, um, I, as a classroom teacher, I would never have imagined the breadth and the scope of what a uh, MYSSC or an early reading coach or a K-12 coach can truly offer the school community. Um, I think I can speak for our roles. Uh, we were directly working with students as well as with teachers. Um, and, and we had two direct schools that were assigned to us. So we would split up our week between the two schools. Uh, and we had two indirect schools. Some, some individuals had three indirect schools that we would offer virtual support in terms of providing resources, sharing professional learning opportunities or sharing, you know, lesson ideas and things like that um, virtually. And it would definitely be beneficial for every school to have access to a centrally assigned teacher. Unfortunately, that was not the case. It was very much based on different school needs across the system. And so um, I, I certainly was very lucky to be able to work in, in a, a few different schools in that capacity. Um, and so we work with students and teachers in first determining what are the big school needs based on the school improvement plan, based on what some of the devastating data is in that particular space, um, and, and what the school would essentially like to build upon either on a stu uh, student basis or on a staff basis, like professional learning basis. We planned uh, professional learning communities throughout the school. We, we highlighted um, some of the focus students that were in the different spaces. Uh, and, and we built upon whatever it is that was identified as, uh, as a school need. And, and so we were sort of given this very, very broad... Uh, landscape to work with. But the benefit for us was we were also provided with a copious amount of learning that that we had the privilege to be a part of throughout the year. So um, I learned so much from the Urban Indigenous Education Center. I learned so much from the Center of Excellence for Black Student Achievement, from the Equity, Anti-Oppression, and Anti-Racism team. Um, we had so much science of reading uh, professional devel development that was provided for us this year. So on a teacher level, like I learned so much this year and, and that's another reason why I feel like it's so valuable for teachers to have the opportunity to do this at least once in their careers. Well, I don't know where to begin, Pat. I, I don't, I, I don't even think I really answered anything. I just kind of spoke about. There was a lot of cream so. rise into the top. <laughs> yeah. Um, I talked about, you talked about that consumption piece. It's been eye opening to go into multiple spaces and you didn't talk about this, but then within the central community, mm -hmm. people tap into each other's right. expertise. And so, you know, we've been a part of some podcast studio content creation rooms across the city. So yeah. as much as we've had four or five schools directly under our I know, influence is you know, the wrong word, but for understanding, for, I think we get it for who we were serving. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've extended to talk to schools across all across the board and connect and help build capacity uh, vibrantly. And I think a little bit of the freedom of that coach's space to be able to connect and sort of build your own schedule, allow for these spaces. And as you spoke, I was thinking you talked about um, all the vast PD that we were gifted and we were gifted an infinite amount of professional I I want to clarify, we were not gifted. It was an investment. Mm. All of this costs money. 
money that now is not really being actualized till the end of the school year to measure impact. So I want to be clear that it was not gifted to us in any way. We were not, it, it costs money to provide PD for those 100 plus centrally assigned teachers that now cannot apply that learning in their spaces to see it through till the end of the year. You can set me up for another rant. That is a great point. Mm-hmm. You talk you talk about financial investment in the work and then all of a sudden you disband it before mm-hmm. it even f- comes to fruition or check the data or measure the data. But I can already rant on the fact that I documented everything and then no one ever asked for it when they cut my job. So okay. why are we documenting? That's right. Let's, let's, um, I mean, I'll write it. Don't. I'll jot it down for go. a chant later. Um, what I, was, what I was getting to with the gifted ideas, I was thinking about what is the infrastructure to provide rich PD for teachers? Mm-hmm. I've talked about this before. I, I don't blame my school or any administrator for a lack of professional development, mm-hmm. but I'm like, how do you get vast amounts of PD to your staff? You, 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 can, you can plan a little planning period in your five-day cycle, but that's one 40-minute block in the midst of a day. You can use your staff meetings, but at the staff meetings, what I wrote down here is that staff meetings often become emails just spoken verbally, rules and regulations, how-to on how to uh, log into your IEPs, reminders on this, how much of our PD is repeated every year. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and I'm not even saying that it's in, unjustly repeated, you know, the IEP reminder PD session. All right, 30, 35 minutes. But the, the amount of time that I'm curated as a teacher to get PD is small. And if we're going to be using it extensively for repeat information, even if it's valuable, means that something's not being delivered. Right. I taught 21 years. I was never given a PD session on assessment. Right. And, and I've used that as an example many times. As our podcast, we were able to go and fill that gap. Right. But I think, how do we provide this to teachers? And I've thought that this is one of, you know, when I sort of mocked the system for a bit, this infrastructure, I think, is a pretty good infrastructure to provide relevant PD to teachers. And so when gifted or expensed different spaces for learning for our growth, that investment is, is that because we are in multiple different spaces, it will be able to manifest into other spaces where we can work and collaborate with teachers, not on their extra time, not after school, but we're in the classes with them, collaborating, talking. We can free up. We were able to free up with administrators to get planning time to talk these things through, to be able to impart our knowledge that's gift, gifted or expense to us into those classrooms. And I thought this is actually a really valuable means because it's authentic. Mm-hmm. Um I get the PD, I explore the PD, I bring it into classrooms, and I'm open about this. And this is one of the d- dynamics, Pat, and you can jump in, is that we keep talking about we're not the experts. Okay, this is true, we're not the experts. But when you walk into a teacher space, you ain't their equal. And it's not necessarily hi- on a hierarchy. We don't have the same experiences at the moment. The teacher's going through the grind yeah, daily. That's right. We're being... I'm going to use gifted again, gifted, the cream rises to the top, (laughs) gifted all these experiences. And so how do I bring these experiences back into the classroom? And so when I was thinking about this, this to me is the perfect model to bring that in. I can bring in the thinking classroom, the indigenous storytelling, the science of reading, because I've been given these space. And so in that dynamic of teacher coach, we're equals on a certain level, but and you want to go in there and not position yourself as an expert, but you can't go in there and position yourself that I'm just doing what you're doing. That's not what's happening. Right. And teachers know this. They know that you're not as accountable to the daily grind of teaching. So you have to be open to, I've been the recipient of this PD, this PD, this PD. Here's three things that I've actually done in my classroom when I was mm-hmm. teaching that I've seen work and not work. And these are three things that I was really wowed by the PD, but I, I've never done it before, but I would right. love to collaborate with you to bring it forward. And I think there's a, there's a necessity as a coach to be open to your positionality. Of course. So yes, not an expert, but also not trying to say I'm doing the same thing you're doing. Right. We're not teaching as a coach. It was tiring, but it's not teacher tiring. Right. Well, I, I'm doing some teaching, some teachering, but I'm not a teacher in that moment. There's a slight difference. There's not that daily grind. Yes. There's not that gap. There's not that break. There's not this investment that sort of inspires you. Like when we did do two or three great days of PD, we probably did a day of PD once a week, roughly. Don't don't document that as a statistic, but roughly. we were. It, it's inspiring to get such relevant PD. So how do we 
gift it. Now, I guess we are gifting it now. We are, we are gifting it, it to them. Mm. Uh, and that is part of the role mm. because this is a meaningful way to bring that professional development into the school. So you are absolutely right when you say that there really isn't time. Um, even PLCs become a lot of gab, right? Mm -hmm. So PLC sessions, maybe you have an hour built into your schedule every, every month um, for your grade team to meet together and work on things. Be but it becomes discussing really small things because it's difficult to get into the meaty stuff um, during those in-school sessions. And, and we know how inconsistent they can be. And this was a really consistent way for you to be able to work with a centrally assigned teacher to build something of significance and of meaning, which is why I think that it's so important at the beginning, Che, that you mentioned that once we are back in the classroom, we'll have a real appreciation for what these centrally assigned teachers can do for us. And, and now that we know what we have done, Done and what we could have done uh, in working with staff members, it really gives us a little bit more direction. Like you can really say, you know, I've really wanted to implement more science of reading in my intermediate classroom because I, as a classroom teacher, never had that learning mm -hmm. until this year. This is the first year that I've had intentional science of reading for the junior intermediate classroom in my entire career. And I would love to be able to plan something around that. Um, but I don't have the time based on that grind. There's extracurriculars, there's duty during the day. There's all kinds of things that are happening, all kinds of interruptions. There's really not a lot of time for planning for this. And we know that you need to go photocopy one thing during your prep that takes up the entire prep. So there's really no time for this. But in this way, you can really work collaboratively uh, with the, the centrally assigned teacher that is in the school, the coach that is in the school, to build something meaningful that you can actually measure impact with. I like the term building because you do get to build stuff. And yes, you can curate great resources and great resources have been curated for you. But I've always felt as a teacher, there's something special about a, a unit or a lesson that you've designed yourself and that's tough as a teacher to design everything. This is why we fall back. To, and I'm not even going to get into the textbook argument, but this is why we will fall back to a textbook during certain periods of the day because we can't be designing our right. own lessons For all the time everything. as much as we know we want to. And that yeah. doesn't mean building it out of nothing. We know we're curating from different spots. But that ability to collaborate, I found teachers that were really confident and comfortable with a coach right away we're really keen to collaborate on planning so we, right. we both bring in a couple of different pieces you'd build a unit you'd build a lesson and you would implement and it. then you would co-teach that's mm -hmm. another piece too you have the opportunity now to have somebody in the space with you when you are when you are uh executing this lesson or this unit with the class so you have somebody to sort of have your back when maybe it's not going the way that you want it to and one of you can be documenting what is happening in the space while the other one is teaching or you can just be throwing it back and forth to each other what a phenomenal experience to be able to try something new that you're unsure about and you're not sure of how it's going to go you can split up the class into different ways you can you can do essentially whatever you want it's such a fantastic resource to have in the classroom and I certainly um, in my first year of doing this role uh, first and last um, it's such a great eye-opening experience for me and and such a way like I have a new appreciation for centrally assigned teachers in their different roles and we haven't really talked about the early reading coaches and the K-12 coaches as much. We don't really have that firsthand experience to be able to do that. But um, essentially, we're, we're talking about some very important pieces to education, to, uh, to collaboration, and to working on some of the things that we know we need to work on in schools, but never really have the ability or the time to be able to do so. Fab, I can just highlight all of this with two anecdotes, two stories. So mm -hmm. Um, one, I'll tap into two stories and you can cut me off if you want. One is a story about knowledge that was expensed to me that was able to gift back to a classroom, which I hadn't done as a teacher. So I couldn't go in and say, I've done this before. Let's try it. And there's a lot of work with building thinking classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I had a partner or a collaborative partner that was in on the ideas and we talked, but we were open about the idea that neither one of us had done it. And we wanted to implement a few of the problems and we wanted to implement a few of the strategies and we want to model it and we wanted to go through it. And so there was a little bit of apprehension our first time because neither one of us had really gone through the tasks, the, the standing spaces, the, the open-ended questions, the, the means to respond. And 
I think as a teacher, there's there's a confidence, or if you can build that relationship, there's a level of comfort to try it as a duo, that collaboration yeah. piece. And so that partnership really turned out really well because we sort of dabbled with building thinking classrooms together. Right. And it was a fantastic learning experience. And so as a coach, I feel that, and then coupled with that, I was able to advocate for some release time and we could plan and we could curate some questions. And so in that moment, being given that type of, uh, PD, I was able to bring it to a classroom teacher. We were able to collaborate and plan and have a go with it. And then I would give another one. I, On top of the expertise we have, I also think there's something about coaches have their own personal passions that lead to their own competencies. And mm-hmm. you know, you and I both brought on top of the PD that we were receiving, we also had our experiences with podcasting and digital artwork and uh, amplifying student voice and those type of connections. And Uh, one teacher was working on a novel study. And so my ability to collaborate was they wanted to tap into my ability to create digital arts. And so we designed a a unit where the students were going to create brand new book covers for their book study. Mm -hmm. And so they tapped into an original skill I had of going into Adobe and building the book cover and original. But in our preparation for that lesson, I could connect that to enhancing my teaching because of our work through indigenous storytelling. When we were curating, exploring of covers and we were looking for dystopian covers a a year ago, I would have just taken very traditional covers, Blade Runner. (laughs) Um, But I was able to now be much more inclusive and aware that I wanted to have different cultures represented in their ideas of a dystopian future in the books that they were written to bring to class. And so all of a sudden, it was a wonderful unit of on the basis. We were just building book covers, but the training that I was given was able to collaborate with the teacher to create a lesson where all of a sudden it was a great lesson. And I think it became an even greater lesson yeah. through that other knowledge. And so exactly, I was going to say, um, I wanted to add on to that anecdote because it's it sort of it's similar to an experience for myself that was new and um, something that I learned a lot from as well. Um, we we had a year-long collaborative inquiry with the Urban Indigenous Education Center. And so we, we visited um, the UIEC several times throughout the year as a group. And through our collaborative inquiry, even in our small group sessions, um, I learned a lot about Indigenous story work. And this was, you know, something that I was able to to learn from, build upon, and in collaboration with the classroom teacher, be able to apply it into the work that we were already doing, which was so, so great for me, even like on a personal level as a teacher, because this is something that I would never have learned otherwise. Mm. And so, and never would have applied to my teaching. So we actually, in one of the grade seven, eight classes that I was uh, working with, um, we were reading the book The Marrow Thieves by Sherry Dimeline and a phenomenal dystopian novel um, that features uh, indigenous communities uh, throughout Canada. And it takes place in the future and a phenomenal read. The students really enjoyed it. And we were mid-novel when I was participating in the Indigenous story work. And I went back to the teacher and I said, you know, I've done some learning over the past couple of weeks about Indigenous story work protocols that I wasn't really aware of prior to this collaborative inquiry that we were doing. And I was wondering if we could work it into the knowledge that the we've already provided for students around this novel. And so um, together we worked on this this. Uh, additional lesson, but we had to backpedal. So we went back into the classroom and said, you know, uh, we've been doing this amazing work with this novel and it's been phenomenal. You guys have been doing great, but, um, there's something that we missed, uh, in, in providing this knowledge to you. And so we actually should have done this at the beginning of the novel and talked about the story work protocols with you as a class, but I'm wondering if we could do this now. And it was really well received by the students and they did a lot of really great learning and talking about um, how we would honor and acknowledge uh, indigenous storytellers at the beginning of any work that we do around story. And uh, And for myself, it was just such a 
such a learning experience for me that I was, it, it totally changed the way that I presented the story to the, to the class. And so for me, that was such a great way for me to bring this, in, not only bring it into the classroom, but also change my own pedagogy in terms of indigenous learning in the classroom, uh, and, and acknowledging those, um, those calls to action as part of truth and reconciliation. So, um, that was something meaningful that I really got out of this, that I'm sure was also very much the same for the teacher that I was working with as well. So, um, yeah, that's my little anecdote that, you know, was sort of, I was, uh, reminded of as you were speaking of yours. The anecdotes are important because this is, this is the teacher talk. That's the authentic conversation. And, and we want to hear those stories of how it actually looks and mm -hmm. feels and sees in the class, which as you were talking, sort of reminds me, how can the teacher use a coach? And so I, I've been working this out in my mind a little bit. And as a teacher now, if I had a coach come in, I would now be, now that I'm aware of all the learning they're doing, I would actually question them, not question to weaponize, to catch them, say, what learning are you doing and what are you excited to try to implement? Right. And let's build on that. Yes, absolutely. Um, because, you know, in my list of, of ideas as, as a coach, now flip this, what can you try not to do as a coach to alienate? Because it is very tough to build that trusting relationship because one teachers are aware of the inconsistency to which you will be in buildings. This is, mm -hmm. this is, this, this is a reality and teachers need you every day. Yeah. And if they don't have you every day, how can they rely on you? That is a very tough trust to build. Uh, and so it can be alienated quickly because it's very fragile. And I have sort of learned as a coach or have sort of reasoned out as I build my own philosophy, not to go and question because I think we run into, we, we get a low resolution to understand questioning is good, questioning is good, questioning is good. Questioning is good when you've built a relationship so that the recipient of the question knows what your intention is. Mm -hmm. And I was in a PD and, and, and someone was sharing, I question all the time. If I was a coach and I walk into a room and I start to question people, uh, I, I don't get no sense that you're building those questions to build something greater. Sounds to me like you're weaponized. Sounds to me like a trap. Yeah. And so I would actually... I would give, as my six months as a coach, I would give my opinion to coaches. As much as we love the idea of questioning, be mindful that you haven't built that relationship yet with a teacher to start throwing out questions right away. Questioning does not come off as as enlightened as we think it does. It quite often comes off as, as because it, it's used very often, to weaponize and sort of sinister, uh, secretly collect data that's just going to be used against you I later. I was just going to say, it's data collection, right? When you question, and, and all data can be used as a very valuable tool, but it can also be used, like as, as you said, as a weapon. And so it is, um, it does become very tricky to go in and question, question, question. It was never my approach to question, question. Um, it was very much my, my approach to just observe and watch and see the things that are happening and then maybe make suggestions if, if it was something that, you know, was, very glaring. Um, but otherwise it was very much a building opportunity, but trust yeah. has to be there. And that is very, very important. You can Something that's really important that, um, that you did mention is that we are inconsistent and we don't have a great track record now at this mm. point. Right. So it's been a few years of redeployment um, with us in these roles, uh, the, the role has not continued to the end of the year. And so, yes, you're there. Yes. You are providing all of this input. Yes. You are collaborating with the teachers. And then all of a sudden there's hardly any warning and you're gone. And all of the things that the teacher was working on with you, they, they, they can stop unless the teacher feels that they are confident enough to keep going with the work that you were doing collaboratively. So you don't have a great track record and you're also not in there every single day. The students, it takes a long time for them to get to know you and for them to get to trust you as well. And so it, it is an uphill battle um, where you have to try and make this impactful change in a very small period of time with very little arsenal. <laughs> yeah. And Pav, as you talked about that, you brought up some great points. This is also why administrators can, can be hesitant, although I haven't, um, this is why I would understand if they were hesitant. Right. I'd never had any experience where, uh, administrators were hesitant. Actually, they were always very open Positive to the resource and wanted yeah. to build something and wanted to connect something, uh, to something meaningful. I would also as I think further about how do you get yourself collaborating and connected with a, a, a teacher, 
I moved slowly in my schools because I didn't want my administrator to just assign me because there's a stigma if you are assigned to a teacher, assigned mm -hmm. to a class. Now, if you could be designated for an entire grade and build a schedule, that's one thing. But I wanted to be, I wanted not to make people uncomfortable to bring me in their space, wanted to inspire them. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I float around, if, if there was an open invite, so in one of my schools, the principal had an open invite and one teacher said yes right away. I said, perfect. Committed my time and I just said, I'm just going to be visible. I'm going to try to help produce some content. Hope the word gets around and then someone else will want to invite in. Mm -hmm. And and that worked. It was slower at front at first, but there wasn't this stigma that I was just coming into certain rooms right. or uh, this, this class needed some help. It was more of like, can I show that I have some worth and people want to reach out and, and, and tap into that. And one of my things I always commented was confidence and competency was a great window uh, I found with teachers, teachers that were already feeling really confident and have a lot of competency. And that's not because maybe they're in the same grade year after year. They, they were very comfortable with their content. They knew their own gaps. Yeah. And so they wanted to bridge that gap or, or, or they knew they needed more support and they wanted support with this. And I felt that to be very beneficial. And I felt that to be a good window to building a great relationship. And then that, the, the noise right. that builds from those, those collaborations they, they, they get spoken to other teachers and then other teachers ask, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And it worked really well. And so I sort of think about how do you set yourself up to try to be successful, avoid necessarily the questioning and avoid getting yourself placed in a space because be mindful how that resonates and how that lands on a staff. Yeah. Oh, those are great tips, Che. Um, and I also want to add, um, bring something to the table. Mm. I think that that is uh, an important that was important for, I know you and I, because it really, it provided teachers with an opportunity to say, okay, well, I can, I can actually see what you can offer me right off the bat. So for us, we were very fortunate. We were able to bring in our podcasting and content creation into all the schools that we were at. And, and luckily enough, every, every school that we were serving was very happy to participate in, in some of the, that, that podcasting or content creation that we were offering because they they could see immediately how it would impact them and their work with student voice in their schools. And so um, that was really fortunate for us, but it can be as simple as, you know, you've learned how to do something and you can offer this thing. So provide, provide like lunch and learns for mm. that one thing that you can bring to the table and just put it out there. It's like, I'm going to do a lunch and learn on how to create, um, how to use we video, you know, um, and we're going to do that at lunch and we can, and then all of a sudden you've got interest. Um, you're, you've inspired a few teachers to, to participate in the thing that you are offering for them. I think lunch and learn attendance was one of the markers that people were interested in this content. Mm hmm. And I felt like I was making an impact because I, I felt when I was going through schools that a couple of times, like, oh, this is going to be two or three people and there'd be 10 people. And you're like, OK, yeah. people are curious. People are open to, to tapping into That's your right. expertise. And I thought that was a for me when you brought that up. I said, oh, yeah. Lunch and learn for me was probably the most impactful data I could take yeah. that, uh, that what I was offering was wanted because it's a non-intimidating space mm. right you're not being assigned this person who's supposed to come into your room and supposedly fix what you're doing in your space um, but you're inviting people into a space where you are very comfortable already and you have something to offer and it's non-threatening and you can say this is something that I've done this is something that I've tried this is something that I know has been successful with x y and z um, here it is for you if you'd like to try it please invite me into your space if you'd like to collaborate with me and we can work together on this and there's your in there's your way into a classroom there's your way into collaboration they can see how non-threatening you are they can see that you're not here to fix them as teachers and uh and then they're more open to work with you so i think that that was a really great thing and the lunch and learns that you and i provided for schools were very successful and great ways for p teachers who had never had the opportunity to meet you already to be like oh now mm -hmm. i know who you are and now i know what you've been doing here in the school so i can come and speak to you whenever i want to which is great should we take a little break? Yeah, I think a little break, and then maybe we can start to commercial wrap break. Up. I've got maybe one other, t two or other things, maybe maybe fifteen other things I'd like to talk about. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's. 
Pack we'll, it in for we'll two We'll go hours. commercial and come right back. And you're listening to episode 126 of the Pav and Pav Show. <laughs> Hi, this is Stephen Hurley from Voice Ed Radio, and you are listening to the Che and Pav Show. And this episode is brought to you by Coffee Cream. Because if you don't have coffee cream, what's going to rise to the top? And you're listening to the Che and Pav Show. You going to bring us back, Pav? No, that's I your guess, job. I, guess I was going to make a back. joke, but then uh, you started the music. And now I don't have the joke. Or it's not funny anymore. Because you forgot it? Uh, it's just not a play. I'm working on laughing at people's jokes. You, uh, excuse me. You've been laughing a lot at my jokes. And then and then immediately you stop yourself and like, you're not supposed to be funny. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and I'm not supposed to find people funny. <laughs> I'm breaking you. That's, getting old. It's taken me five years and I'm doing it. <laughs> um, Making yeah. My, yep. Great conversation so far. Not since we come back from the commercial, but no, before it's that, been, great. <laughs> it's been a little choppy. But um, no, we've hit on some very important points and, and you're making me really miss <laughs> the MYSSC role. Oh boy. And, uh, and I was the bitter one to start this episode. You know what? It was, it was such a great role. And I, I felt, <laughs> I felt like my, the work that I was doing, at, not that it doesn't feel meaningful when you're in a classroom, but there's just so much going on in a teacher's day and a teacher's space. This was really a great way for you to interact with teach with teachers and students, really get to know the students they they began like the, that moment when they began to say hi miss wander in the hallways was such a great feeling for me because it took so long and it doesn't normally take that long in a classroom because they see you every single day mm-hmm. and then when they started coming to you and asking you for things and then it's like are you going to be in our class today are you going to be working with us are we doing podcasting today are we doing this today um it was just such a great feeling to know that you were starting to make that impact. And then I just feel like, ugh, it's all gone. And now we also went out in a blaze of glory when we had that, uh, lunch and learn the two of us in the same space doing a lunch and learn for two schools. Yeah. That was really great. The excitement for teachers to drive over to another building at lunch is just fantastic. And then two days later I was getting punched in the face, not (laughs) physically, literally as a middle school French teacher. All right, not, kids. not literally. Not literally. No. Did I say literally? Not literally. You said not physically, and then but you said literally. literally. <laughs> oh, boy, that's a riddle. <laughs> what did he just say? No, I know. It, and it, it has not been easy. Um, but it really goes to show what what it's like as an occasional teacher, especially in the end of May and June. And, and it's really... Uh, it's. It's unfortunate. An entire, entirely new appreciation for what an occasional teacher goes through on a grind. Yeah, of a day. exactly. And exactly. how much you can set them up for failure if you're if the lesson plans not necessarily they're bad if they are not astute. Just how open it is to interpretation if you're not used to a space because you don't know if you're getting an occasional teacher to be there ten times or it's the first day in the building. Right, right, and and. I've never supply taught. I've done maybe two half days at the very beginning of my career, like 17 years ago. I don't know how to be an occasional teacher. So when I go into the classroom, I'm not looking for the same things that an, an, an experienced occasional teacher looks for or how to interact with the students to get the information that you need to have a successful period or two periods or three periods. And we thought we were very prepared. You know, we had developed a whole bunch of lessons. Um, but then you remember, I don't have like the ability to cart around all of the things that I need to be a really great successful uh, supply teacher for those couple of periods or for that day. And so you do what you can, but there are some days when you're just like, oh my gosh, everything that I planned only took 15 minutes and now I have another 45 minutes to kill. How am I going to do that? And with these (laughs) great twos and threes that only speak French. (laughs) (laughs) And then you could talk about this is this is why the misallocation of resources, because someone of your talent, there needs to be someone with a talent for that space in that That's space. Right. And we deviate your talents in another space and bring it here. This this is a, another reason why the system is so dysfunctional on some levels, yet so functional on other levels. Let me come back to the coaching. I had one other point that okay. I wanted to highlight is that one, as a coach, 
you do have a different relationship with administration than you do as a teacher. And I'm, I've never really been, well, sometimes I've been said no by my administrator. In fact, so often that I would ask for something <laughs> I didn't want to make sure they said no. Um, but in the long run, I've always had pretty good relationships. But as a success counselor, I don't think I was ever denied mm -hmm. anything that I asked for. Right. And so you have uh, administrators. That's what we talked about earlier. I never had my the, all the admins I had really trusted and were very thankful for coming to this space. Yes. They wanted to build something great. So they were open to if I wanted to book three periods off to connect with the grade six teacher to plan. It was done. Yeah. Uh, if I wanted a resource, it was purchased. When we talked about um, making sure we had uh, the f white book charts, boom, order right away. When I was planning, time right away. When the podcast, gear was spent right away. Time made sure so I could curate resources mm -hmm. and, and build these spaces. And Pav, I thought, one, as a teacher, you should know that those coaches now become ways for you to get not to say to use them to get stuff, but being aware that they have a voice with the administrators that are a little different from a teacher. If you've got a staff of 50 teachers, even by principal mathematics, you cannot say yes to everyone because you can't say yes 50 times. So you're not going to say yes 10 times because you get yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to be angry That's about it. That's a great it. point. But if you have a coach, the resources I'm buying are ultimately for entire schools or entire grade levels. And they're connected directly to the, the school improvement plan. School improvement plan. And so the money is there and the accessibility to grab those resources. So one, as a coach, recognize that you have this ability, this purchasing power, this allocation of resources that the, the classroom teacher doesn't have and can be frustrated when they don't have. And classroom teachers, when you tap into that resource, you tap into that expertise, but you also tap into the fact that they can get things that maybe you couldn't get. Now, you don't want frivolous things. It's not about getting a projector because your light bulb's burnt out. But when you think about bigger things, like you said, connected to the SIP, there is access points here. Right, exactly. And and yes, you're absolutely right. It's not not something to be misused, um, but it, it it is absolutely a way for you to be able to work on something that you do deem to be very meaningful and very impactful for your classroom environment, for your, for your own personal learning, something that you are going to be able to use to support and serve the students because ultimately that's what it is all about and that's what it should be all about. And I do feel that over this past year, we truly were able to serve students and serve teachers and be able to work towards making a very meaningful impact in the classroom. Um, I'm very upset and sad that we were not able to see it through uh, to, to be able to document all of that impact towards the end. Um, we were working on some really meaningful things that came to a very abrupt halt uh, and, and there are all, all very important things that are supposed to be helping students um, and we were not able to see them through. And I do hope that these jobs do come back to some capacity in the future. Um, I would love to do it again sometime, but I think at this time I need a little bit of stability in my day to day and be very, very far away from prep payback. <laughs> it reminds me of the joke by Sinbad because I don't explain education through comedians. Uh, would you do it again? Yeah, but not for free. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's got to be something in return. Uh, I think it's time for a swag bag. It's been a good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. We has. haven't done an episode in probably 16 months. <laughs> it's been something like that. But before we get to our swag bag, we do have a, a, some stuff that what's new that mm -hmm. has sort of also kept us away from podcasting for ourselves yeah. as much because we haven't been short on podcasting. Pav, you did this wonderful production for our board on the Sick Heritage Month, mm -hmm. a really, really polished piece of student-led interviews. Very polished, very well done. Uh, I know you made me redo the graphic art 17,000 times. It just wasn't perfect. That's right. But you were engaged in that project. We've also collaborated and connected with ETT to form their podcast, Teacher Talk. Teacher Talk. Yeah, the Elementary Teachers of Toronto. And we've been lining up and curating some interviews for that, and we're really excited about that project to, t to really connect locally and hopefully provide a space that helps further unify mm -hmm. the Elementary Teachers of Toronto. So we're really excited about that project, so that's been taking a lot of our time well. We've done a few presentations, but not as many as we should have been doing. Um, but we're getting... That's sort of been taking our time, so yeah. we're excited to get back on the mic here today to sort of talk a little off the cuff about yeah. our own content and it's been fun because the cream rises to the top and let's get to our swag bag. Ooh, yeah. Pav, my swag bag, one, I had 
be mindful of your positionality mm -hmm. as coach to divide to build that relationship no you're not an expert but you're also not their peer in regards to the daily grind of teaching acknowledge that beautiful uh, professional development you have been gifted <laughs> in order to gift it back <laughs> appropriately a two for me was as a coach don't get into the pos the, the space of i want to question because I think questioning lands, not how we think it lands, because we get caught on the pedagogy of questioning, which is great, but in a dynamic, you have to have that relationship solidified for in order to make sure that question's landing how you think it's landing. Mm -hmm. The reverse on my swipe by three is teachers know how to tap into coaches. Yeah. I, we know there's hesitancy. We know there's um, an inconsistency problem, but know what coaches are bringing to your space. They are bringing, not necessarily, I wanna get you to do something, but they are being given all kinds of professional development that you can tap into. So be confident, be competent, and know to ask them questions. Ask them, what have you been learning about that you would love to try to do in this space? And let's build something together. It is a tough dynamic. It takes time to build that relationship. But Pav, you and I will, as I go to number four, this is, I think, the most impactful and most meaningful way to bring current and relevant uh, PD and professional development to teachers because teachers don't have the time otherwise to absorb the vast amounts of things that we want them to learn because they right. don't all have a podcast. They don't all have a podcast, uh, um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, aside from personal professional development, I think that this is the absolute best way to get that learning into classrooms and a fantastic swag bag. Thank you for wrapping it up for us. And you've been listening to episode 126 of the Che and Pav show. And yes, we took up a lot of space, but hey, it's a <laughs> cup of coffee in the big time. Cup of coffee in the big time. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you next time. And this has been a Che and Pav Educational Services production.